Welcome to my channel. My name is Lauren and I am self-converting my Ram Promaster to live, travel, and work in full-time on the road. In today's video, I'm going to show you how I made my U-shaped convertible bed that converts from a bed to a table and couch. As usual, check the timeline of this video for time codes that will allow you to jump around to different sections and check the description box below for affiliate links to products and tools I use. With that, let's get started. Before getting to the install of my convertible bed, I did just want to go over some pros and cons of this setup as compared to another common option you will see in the van life community, which is a fixed bed. So if you're just here for the install, use the time codes below to jump ahead. When drawing up any blueprints, one of the first decisions you should make is your bed setup then everything else in your van build should revolve around that. So a convertible bed can be done many different ways. Here is an example from Court and Nate with a U-shaped couch and table that converts to a bed, which is the approach I decided to take. Similarly, a convertible bed can be done with two couches and a table like this build by Van Life Sagas where there are no storage boxes in the middle and it's just an aisle. Another approach is to take a bench with slats that pull out to make up an entire bed area, as seen here by Lewis the Van. And the last convertible bed option I will mention is the Murphy's bed, like this one by Two Wandering Souls, where the bed is hidden in the wall and folds down for use. Now when it comes to a fixed bed, this usually refers to a platform that is positioned higher, takes up the entire back of the van, has tons of storage underneath, and always serves as a bed, as seen here from the road to Spoons. To take that farther, you might also see individuals who combined the idea of a convertible bed with a higher platform similar to a fixed bed, like We Are Wandering Home did here. And lastly, you may also see individuals that do bunk beds and even beds that have a lift system to raise and lower the platform as seen here by Sarah and Alex James. Now here are some pros and cons to a convertible bed and a fixed bed. The nice thing about a convertible bed is that you have a table and seating area that you can work from remotely and that you can host a small gathering of people for a dinner or a game night. Whereas a fixed bed is always a bed. So if you do decide to do a fixed bed, I would recommend finding it somewhere else in your van build that you can incorporate a seating area for yourself and any potential guests you might have along the way. The convertible bed also gives a nice open feeling and concept in the van, whereas a fixed bed is usually positioned higher and takes up the entire back of your van. Another big thing to consider is storage. U-shaped convertible beds do not have as much storage as a fixed bed does. The fixed bed has what we consider in van life a garage area. This allows you to fit a lot of stuff underneath the bed, especially if you're an outdoorsy individual and you have an inflatable paddleboard, skis, or a bike. That's a lot of time where people will store big things like that. However, the one thing I did not like about it was that you have to access the garage from outside of your van. I personally didn't like this because if it's cold, rainy, or just dark outside, I might not want to leave my van to get something in the back. I also feel like it's hard to organize things back there and that you're constantly pulling something out to reach something that's further in there. Also not to mention, I just was worried about privacy and security. I don't want to have to get out in the middle of the night where there's people around me, open up my van and they see that I'm living in my van, they see everything that I have in my van. So. That just didn't give me um, a good feeling. I am doing my van build so that everything can be accessed within the van and everything can be used in the van. Now there are some cons of having a convertible bed. Like I already mentioned, there's a lot less storage when compared to a fixed bed. So my two big boxes in the back are going to have my plumbing and electrical setup in them with no additional space for anything else, which is a huge bummer. And another thing that I hear commonly with people that have convertible beds is that constant need to convert the bed from a bed to a couch and table. Although that whole process probably takes a total of five minutes, it's still a hassle and it isn't always easy. So that's something that I do hear people complain about as well as you're going to want to plan for where you're going to store the bedding for your bed. So when it's in a couch and table mode, where are you going to put your sheets and your comforter and any extra pillows? So just plan for that accordingly in your build as well. 
And another con to having a convertible bed is the mattress. When you have a convertible bed, you need several different individual pieces to make up your bed and your couch area. So you usually have to buy a foam mattress, cut it, make covers for each individual piece. Whereas with a fixed bed, sometimes you can get away with using a full-size mattress or you just buy a foam mattress, make one cut, sew one giant cover, and then call it a day. And lastly, my bed area is not as wide as fixed beds usually are because when you do a fixed bed, you can build out and frame out these boxes that will add a few inches to your entire width of the bed, whereas my bed is lower and um, being convertible, I just could not get those extra inches like you can in a fixed bed. With that, let's get to the install. Throughout the video, the process remains consistent. Plan, measure, cut, drill pocket holes, sand, wood glue, one inch brad nails, one inch Craig screw, then wipe away any excess wood glue. Before making any cuts, plan accordingly. Some things to take into consideration for the dimensions of your bed includes the space that you're going to leave over your head for any overhead cabinets that you plan to install so you can sit underneath them comfortably, the thickness of your mattress, the space between your knees and the ground when sitting on the couch, space left in the middle for two people to sit across from one another, how many people would be sleeping in the bed, the depth of other cabinetry, and most importantly, what you plan to store in those boxes. For example, the four boxes that make up my bed area are going to house my plumbing, electrical, shoes, and sports equipment. So I gathered all those items first so I could take measurements and plan accurately. When finalizing measurements, I found it easiest to start with the box's overall dimensions, then break it down to each individual piece. Remember to subtract the thickness of the top and bottom of the box from the height of the side boards, and the same concept for the side pieces. Take into account the thickness of the front and back boards and subtract that from the side dimensions. Another thing to consider is how you plan to piece each box together to give it the cleanest finished look. In other words, there are two ways to piece a box together, either screwing the front and back pieces into the side pieces or vice versa. Either way, there will still be sides of the box with the ends of the plywood visible. So. Plan ahead which piece is going to screw into which so the cleaner option is what's seen in the van. You could also purchase edging that you can iron on for any visible ends. This will give it a more finished appearance. For the bed area, I am using half inch Baltic birch plywood which is strong and durable due to its multiple layers of wood. This sheet consists of 9 layers whereas other plywoods usually have 3. Although cabinetry is generally built with 3 quarter inch material, I decided to use half inch to save on weight and money. I'd recommend cutting all the pieces necessary for a section at the same time. That way you don't need to adjust the table saw multiple times and you can be sure that everything will be cut to the same dimension. Focusing on one task at a time before moving on will make the process go by a lot quicker. To start, I began working on the two main boxes that will go over the wheel wells. These boxes would be identical to one another. For the backboard to fit around the height and length of the wheel well, I used a skill saw and jigsaw to remove a section of the board. When cutting, I used painter's tape to stick to the sides of the wood that are squared so I know which ends to measure off of and to run along the fence of the table saw to keep my work as squared as possible. You could also mark this with a pencil, but the tape is easier to see and it doesn't leave any unwanted lines on the wood. That's perfect. After checking that the back piece fits properly over the wheel, it's time to make the small inside box to cover the wheel well. I drilled pocket holes on the two side pieces to screw into the front board. Then I added wood glue and one inch brad nails to hold the side in place while I screwed one inch long Craig screws in the pocket holes, which is the screw length that is recommended for a half inch boards. I place the pocket holes inward so they won't be visible with the final product. Then I'm going to lay it down and screw my three Craig Jig pocket screws in. Alright, you just clean up the glue and you're good to go. Okay, so now it's time to connect your back piece of the bed to your wheel well box. Here, 
here, I am screwing pocket holes into the bottom of the unit so I have a way of attaching the bottom of the box when it comes time. From there, I worked on the side pieces of the overall box which will be screwed to the back and front boards so no plywood ends are visible in the van, giving it a nice clean look. Therefore, I screwed pocket holes on the sides and bottoms of the boards before sanding and attaching them to the back of the box. more pocket holes on the bottom, again to screw into the bottom part of this entire thing once it's all done. So now you're just gonna use the pocket holes that you put on the sides to screw this into this. Then, I cut the bottom for the two boxes, as well as the tops for the small box on the inside that covers the wheel well. To accurately cut a section for the bottom board to sit around the wheel well, I flipped the box carcass over and lined the board up along the edges so I could trace the cutout around the wheel well with a pencil to know exactly where to cut with a skill saw and jigsaw. On the bottom boards, I screwed more Craig Jig pocket holes around the perimeter for me to be able to secure the unit to my subfloor permanently once it's ready for install. After wood glue and brad nailing the bottom, I flipped the unit upright to add the screws. The overall dimensions on the left and right big boxes with the lid is 21 inches tall, 24 inches side to side, and 54 inches front to back. The small box on the side is 18 inches in height, 35 inches in length, and 8 inches in depth. Between these two boxes, I am going to make two separate storage units to fill the space. One is going to be in the back in the same height as the wheel well boxes, and then the other is going to be a six inch step in front of that for shoe storage and to serve as a footrest when in couch mode. For a clean look, I am securing the box sides into the front and back boards. Therefore, I have pocket holes on both sides of the side boards. To screw the bottom of the box, I have also put pocket holes on the bottom edge of all four sides. The overall dimensions of the middle box with the lid is 21 inches tall, 23 inches side to side, and 17 inches front to back. The lower section is 6 and a quarter inch tall, 23 inches side to side, and 37 inches front to back. When it comes to installing the tops on top of all four sections of my bed area, I have opted into using a piano hinge, also known as a continuous hinge. 
The reason I'm using this is because of their length. It's really crucial to have that support all the way down the full length of the bed because again, the tops are really big, they're heavy. So this is gonna help it stay in place, be secured and not fail over time. So as you can see what this piano hinge is, is it folds within itself, just like that. So there's a few different ways that you can actually install these and mount them. So I grabbed this scrap piece of wood just for me to help demo and provide a visual. Say that this scrap piece was screwed down into the back and then this was the front part of the door. You can have the hinge laid just right on top. Go ahead and screw it in on this board as well as this board. And then when you want to open your door, you're gonna open it and there you go, you have your hinge. So it is visible and you can see it. Obviously I'm gonna have cushions on top of this so it wouldn't be that big of a deal but I think I am going to take the route of making a hidden hinge. Instead, that means that it's going to look like this. So how you would do that is you would install one of these flaps to the inside of that board, and then the other one to the inside of that board as well. And then once you open it, it just looks like that. So it's less hinge. Another thing to note is what width you need for your hinge. If you're installing it hidden like this, then the sides need to be the same exact width as your plywood so that it has something to attach to. So on this side, it is a half inch. On this side, it's a half inch. And then the middle strip is a 1 16th inch. My plywood is a half inch. So when I go ahead and install it right there, I have a place to drill into. Now, if I would have gone a two inch hinge, this would be an inch long over here and it would overhang like that to the point that I wouldn't have anything to screw into. Now, if it's, you're putting on the top and it's visible, I don't really think it matters that much if you have a wider hinge. So some things you're gonna need to consider is the length that you want, the width that you need, and then also the mounting style that you're gonna decide to do. The lids of all the boxes will be made up of two boards with a piano hinge between them. Of those two boards, one will be labeled the back of the lid which is what will be glued and screwed to the box. For the three tall boxes, that backboard of the lid will be an inch and a half wide and three quarter inches wide for the lower middle section, which will have two doors. The reason I'm doing an inch and a half wide board in the back and not making it maybe three, four inches wide is because the closer that you are to the edge, the more supportive and strong your box lid is going to be. When you sit on that lid, it's not gonna cave in as much to cut the hinge to the exact length of the lid, I folded it in half and marked it with a permanent marker where I need to cut. It is important to have the hinge run the full length of the lid for optimal support. Stopping a couple inches short on either side will leave room for air. From there, I secured the hinge to the table with a clamp and began cutting along the line I marked with a Dremel. To ensure I attach the piano hinge correctly, I mocked the final product by placing the hinge between the two boards that make up the lid. This is important because the hinge only folds over completely in one direction and not the other, so you want to make sure you're installing it properly. Once the hinge was aligned, I took a pencil and traced each hole onto the wood. This provides a visual of where I will need to pre-drill for the hinge screws. When pre-drilling, use a bit that is smaller than your screw size and do your best to screw in the middle of the circle and stay as squared to the board as possible. From there, you can begin securing the hinge to the board with the screws provided. I found it best to put a screw in on both ends and one in the middle to start. This helps to hold the hinge in place while installing the rest. Do not tighten the screws all the way down until each hole has a screw in it. Then, Go back through and tighten them all down one at a time while jumping from one end to the other to ensure even tension. Once the hinge is attached to the board, line it up with the other half of the lid and begin the whole process again. So one thing I forgot to do before I went ahead and put the piano hinge on was cutting a hole in this lid so that I have a place for my hand to go into and lift this a lot easier than trying to um, pick it up like this from the front when it's flush to the box. To make my template, I'm going to fold this piece of paper in half. That way, when I cut it out, I have two sides that are symmetrical to one another. Draw half the oval on this side, 
I'm probably going to use this to help me get a nice curve to it. One thing to know if you do cut a hole in this is that your box is going to be underneath this. So you're going to have the thickness of your plywood there. So my plywood's a half an inch thick. So I want to make sure it's set back at least half an inch so I can make that hole. But I also want to set it back a little bit farther so that when I put my hand in to pick it up, my fingertips have something to kind of grip onto. The reason I'm putting tape on both this side and the back side as well is because when I cut with the jigsaw, it tends to eat my wood up pretty badly. So this is going to help prevent that a little bit. That's what my, how big my hole is going to be. Actually a fairly big size. So, I mean, you could trace that or you could just take this and trace this. That way it's going to be consistent with all three lids. So now that I got my oval traced out and centered and pushed back enough to my liking, I went ahead and clamped it down on both ends so I can start cutting with my jigsaw. So first I got to make a hole with the drill that's large enough for my jigsaw blade to fit into so then I can start cutting. the back side instead of the front of the board just because if I knew if it did chew up the wood at all um, at least it'd be on the inside and not the outside of the box lid. Okay so once you get your tops all set and you have your piano hinge on and everything like that it is time to install it onto your boxes itself. I'm going to be attaching this back piece to the box. I'm going to put some pocket holes back here to screw up and into this back piece of the lid. So now I'm taking the lid and lining it up along all of the edges. I'm going to pull back open that top back piece of the lid. Apply some wood glue. So now I'm going to flip it over and put the screws in. This box is the lower storage box between my U-shaped convertible bed. Uh, I went ahead and like I said, put those pocket holes on the side so I can screw up and into the lid. Now, what I just finished doing and started working on actually was these support beams right here. I have one right here um, flush to the box surface so far without the lid. And then I have this one right here as well that I'm planning on installing on this side. They are three quarter inch Baltic birch plywood and I nailed them in with two inch brad nails from the outside so that I would hold it in place so I could screw it with my wood screws. Screwed my wood screws directly on the outside right there on the back and the outside on the side right here. The reason I have these support beams is because this is going to be my lid. This is half of the box lid. So it's going to sit like that. It has a piano hinge going all the way down so that I can open the door like so. On this side of the box where it does not have that support piece, you can see that when I put this lid on it and push right there in the middle, it bows very, very easily. I didn't even put all of my weight on it. And this is going to be something that I'm going to be walking on a lot. I put these support beams here to go right underneath the hinge. When I go and walk on it and put weight on it, it's not bowing or giving at all right now. So it's just giving it a lot more support. Another thing that I'm doing is I'm going to be running a support beam down the middle of this box, the full height of the box, so that when the lid door closes, it's going to have this piece of wood to rest on. Some of you might be saying that you've seen other people to use shape convertible beds, and when they do have this unit in the middle, they tend to make it a drawer, a pull out drawer for storage. The reason I've decided to do it this way with doors is because number one, I feel like it gives me a lot more space for storage. Number two, I feel like it's easier to access. So if you have a pull out drawer, um, you know, you throw junk in here and stuff, sometimes stuff gets stuck and wedged back there. So it prevents the drawer from opening all the way. I can open these doors when it's in bed mode and the table's right here. I've made enough clearance for it. Also, when it's not in bed mode and it's in table mode, these are going to be accessible.
For the center support beams, I used two half inch Baltic birch plywood strips. I glued them together on a flat surface, clamped them, and then let it sit overnight to dry. The next day, I added pocket holes on both sides of the board for me to secure it in the box permanently. Make sure the support is centered so each door has a half inch support beam. So just like my lower shoe storage box that I did, I added this support beam in the big boxes as well. This is a three quarter inch thick strip of three inch wide board. This way when I put my lid on it, it has this support here for back near the hinge, hinge area so that it doesn't concave in at all when you're sitting on it. One thing to know, if you do not like the look of the pocket holes in your boxes, you can buy pocket hole plugs that you put in each hole with wood glue and then you can sand over it. Personally, I'm not going to worry about it for these boxes, but I will be using them for future cabinetry during the van build. Although the bed area is not 100% complete, you kind of get the idea of how it's going to function. So in this open space right here, this is where my table is going to rest on 3 quarter inch boards that I'm going to attach right here to this side of the box and this side of the big box. So it's going to sit nice and flush to these piano hinges because that's a 3 quarter inch space I left on both sides. So the board's going to slide right down here. That's going to give me a 54 inch by 71 inch wide bed. And then when I want my bed to be in table and couch mode, I will simply lift this table up, connect it to a lagoon table mount that I'm going to be installing later, and then that's going to give me a U-shaped couch with a table that swivels 360 degrees. In the driver's side box, this is going to be storing all of my electrical. So I'm going to have my Battleborn lithium batteries, my multi-plus inverter, charge controller, my distribution panel, and more. And then the box on my passenger side, this is going to house all of my plumbing components. So I have a 30 gallon fresh water tank. I'm gonna have my water pump and all my pecs running through this, feeding into the sink area. And then if you know me, you know that this box of sports equipment and workout gear is always in the back of my car. This stuff is what I plan on putting in this back storage section. I've actually gone ahead and already filled all of that into here and it only fills this box about halfway. So there's plenty of room for me to add more sports and workout equipment, which I'm super excited for. And then for this last section of the bed area, this is where I plan on storing my shoes. So I designed this so that the doors can be opened whether it is in bed or couch mode. The table's not gonna interfere with it when it's down in bed mode and the lagoon table mount won't interfere with it either. So I can access this at all times, which is really important to me. One thing I still need to do for this section is once I lay down my final floor, I'm going to run that flooring up the sides and down this entire middle section to continue that floor design. So after I do that, I'm going to take a drill and drill some small finger holes right here on both lids so that it's a little bit easier to open. After I go ahead and paint my bed area, I'm going to install some gas struts to each of the lids that's going to help hold the door open when I'm trying to access something in that specific box. So in the back section, I am planning on running a board that's the same length and height of all of these boxes to give it a nice clean finished look. Then in this middle section, I'm going to have a fold down table. So if I'm lounging in camp chairs, then I have something I can work on, put my food or drinks on. I would also like to make use of the space on these two boxes, so if you have any ideas of something creative I can do, let me know down in the comments below. And then the very last thing I need to do to finish out this bed area is to buy a foam mattress that I'm going to cut into five pieces, sew some covers, and put them on the mattress. So the five pieces I'm going to be cutting for my mattress is going to be a section to cover this box area, a section to cover this box, and then I'm going to break this area into two. So it's going to have two separate pieces running through here, and that's gonna make up my bed area. Now when it's in couch and table mode, these two sections are going to lift up and go as backrest on both sides. And then I'm going to have a small square section that's going to sit right here. So when this is in bed mode, that small square section, I plan on storing underneath the table right here. With that, I hope this video gave you the confidence and knowledge you need to make your own U-shaped convertible bed. Tune in to my next video where I will be installing my roof rack. Until then, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.